Morning, guys. Well, that's a good song. Um, <clears throat> we're going to pray here, and really it's the, you're good, you're good, you're never going to let me down. You know, sing that until you believe it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> even today we're going to talk about um, Christ as center, Christ as supreme. And um, I was reflecting on this the other <clears throat> day as I was preparing this message, you know, at the if it takes a lifetime, at the end of your life, God wants you to be able to say, you know what, it took me a long time to believe it, but I absolutely believe it. all these years God was for me and never against me. Okay, that's what I mean, he'll never let you down. Okay, so he's, it's one of his goals for us. Let's, um, let's pray and then we'll bounce back into the book of Colossians. Father, um, <clears throat> thank you so much um, for what's taken place in our church. Thank you for Wednesday, those who could make it, it's time to kind of come out of our homes and pray and set aside some time and um, focus again on sacrifice that you've made for us and, and just the unburdening of ourselves, of our sins, and then um, interceding for others and being a grateful people and giving gratitude back to you. And then just boldly asking you, uh, being led by even you yourself of that area in our life where you want to see us renewed and changed and a breakthrough happen, um, you know, whether that's family Um, some other relationship, uh, a hurt, whatever it is, Father. Um, Grateful for times like that, Lord, that we uh, refuse isolating ourselves and we come together uh, as a people. So thank you so much. We have so much to be grateful for. I want to thank you again for um, the offerings that will be taken um, today and um, just all the faithful people in this church week after week, Father. So thank you for what you're going to do in your word today um, as you speak to us. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen. So um, if you're just starting with us, um, we're just starting the book of Colossians, this letter to a fledgling group of new believers, um, written by um, Paul, who was an apostle, a a missionary, who had never been to Colossae, the city, um, but a church was started there by a guy by the name of Epaphras, um, which Paul references several times in this letter, and Paul's writing to combat Um, certain teachings that Epaphras has obviously told them about, but also just as we talked about last week to help them to grow in wisdom and in knowledge. Maybe he was praying for him, I want wisdom and knowledge for you um, in just what God has for you and his will for you. Uh, And then I want you to be strengthened because part of the Christian life is just persevering and not giving up when we want to give up. And then I want you to always be thankful um, because Paul realizes that's part of growth too, right? We all need wisdom and knowledge, right? We've got to figure out both his revealed will, which is the Bible. Okay, what's he saying to me? And then kind of that part of God's will, which is the unknown, right? Which you almost need a, ma- a crystal ball. You're just kind of waiting for it. You're more accepting it <laughs> when, you're, when it's revealed to you. So we all need that wisdom and knowledge. We all need strength for the journey, right? Because there's times we all want to give up, right? Just feel like, man, that's it for me. And so he says, I want you to be strengthened according to his glorious might. Only he can strengthen you. And I always want you to be abounding in thankfulness because there's something when you can get your eyes off what's temporary and get it to where God's been good. You are, you know, like we're singing today. Um, So he kind of gives this platform for growth, okay? Now, then he's going to bounce into this section um, on Jesus, and he's going to make Christ supreme here and central. He's going to talk about who he is and what he's done, and it really carries that theme of being grateful. Uh, and part of this is to, to combat, whenever you read a New Testament letter, neat thing to do whenever you're reading your Bible, you're in the New Testament, look for reasons that you think it might have been written. And you'll find that. You'll find him suddenly start saying, you know, whenever he says, stop doing this, start doing that, why are you submitting to these rules? You'll see this. Why are you submitting to rules like that? It's obvious Paul has heard that either a bunch of people who showed up, and this is what was happening in the early church, because they didn't have a Bible, they didn't have a New Testament, right? They had some letters maybe circulating, but they had teachers who could explain the way more accurately to them, and some of them would come in, and uh, they'd teach them pretty crazy stuff. And so uh, that's a little bit of what Paul's having to do. We have to kind of guess what the problems were, and uh, let me just, I'm going to flip over to Colossians chapter 2, and we'll get to this in, in uh, three or four, two or three weeks, but let me just say a little bit of what was maybe going on. Uh, in 2.8, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human traditions, according to elemental things, and not according to Christ, okay? So 
obviously some type of philosophy had showed up, some type of teaching, and he says, make sure no one takes you captive by anything other than that what you've heard about Christ in your life. And then he'll go on and he'll say, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. So we know if we read a lot of these letters, and Paul would even name that these, what he called these Judaizers, there's people who said, yeah, you've got Jesus, but he's, he's part of the way, but he's not the full way. You need to kind of go back and you need to keep Sabbath days. You know, there's certain days that are high and holy that you've got to keep or God will be ticked off, right? So Paul kind of combats that. There's always this whole thing of you don't have to go back and be a good Jew to be a good Christian, Okay? It's a new time. God's set aside. We don't need special days, seasons, months, temples, churches. God's the temple. God's the church. God's the day. It's all, you know, everything's wrapped up in Jesus now. <clears throat> um, he says, these are a shadow of the things that, to come. Meaning, uh, there was a reason why God set those in place. Christ is the fulfillment all, of all those. He says, um, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you from your hope. He's talking about your hope as a Christian, right? This freedom that you have, insisting on asceticism, which is kind of this rough treatment of the body. I'm going to go without. I'm going to... All kinds of forms, right? Asceticism. Um, oh, I lost my place here. Uh, and the worship of angels going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head, that's church, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. So he's saying, be careful about those who teach you these strange things about, you know, hey, it's about harsh treatment of my body, that's the only way you overcome sensual things, and Paul gets into that later and says, man-made rules, don't taste it, don't touch, don't do it. They, they have a certain amount of wisdom, but they never really keep us from sensual things, okay? And be careful about, you know, this worship of angels. So whatever the strange teaching was, we only get a hint of it, but it's a little bit of what Paul's going to combat. Now, I say that because we need that as a backdrop as he goes into Jesus, okay? So he's going to talk about Christ, and he's doing this to say, you've got everything you need in Jesus. Be careful about listening to all these other people who are showing up and telling you it's worship, you know, it's about angels and about other things, Christ is sufficient. So let's, we're going to bounce in here and we're going to see how Jesus really, to Paul, Jesus is the supremacy, Jesus is the center, Jesus holds preeminence, everything's about Jesus. So make Jesus about everything, okay? So that's our purpose. Let me read the text and then we'll take a look about, about first of all, who Jesus is. So he says this, um, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Okay? So Paul's going to take us from this, here's my great prayer to you, to I'm going to talk to you about Jesus now. I'm going to inform you again who you've placed your trust in. In one sense, he's going to say, and the sufficiency of Jesus for everything. Okay? So the first thing we're going to look at is, we're going to ask this question, because Paul wanted him to know, who is Jesus? It's a good question to ask. Who is Jesus? Okay, because that's what he's answering here. That's the question, okay? Who is Jesus? And um, if you're a note taker, here's the first answer to that question. He is God. Who is Jesus? Jesus is God. That's what Christians worship. They worship Jesus, not as a created being, not as some extra God, not as some lesser God. He is very God of very God, Okay? Christians worship a trinity God found throughout the scriptures because they all bear um, those characteristics of the God um, of the universe. So Jesus is God. What does he say? 1 verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And I'll come back and I'll take a look at what this phrase means. Uh, and then the other, 19, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Okay? 
So who is Jesus? Well, he's God. What does this mean, again, that he, had, he is the image of the invisible God? It means the nature and being of God are perfectly revealed in Jesus. Okay? That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay? And that's why we celebrate Christmas. It was God taking on flesh. Okay? The Son always existed, but now he's become man. We have what we call the God-man. God now in the flesh for us. Fully God. Okay? Jesus claimed this about himself. Jesus went around telling people he was, he was God. He said, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. You want to know what God looks like? Look at me. That's because I and the Father are one. Isn't that crazy? So you want to get a glimpse of what, you know, it's like, oh, God, I'm not sure what he acts. How does God treat people? How does he really feel about people? When does he get angry? When does he not get angry? When does he give a pass? When does he say, read the Gospels, and you will see what God's like. You'll see the compassion. You'll see the wisdom. You'll see the divinity. You'll see it all over the place. Jesus is God, Okay? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, Jesus claimed this about himself. John 8, 58, or we'll, we'll, we'll back it up to 56. Uh, basically, Abraham, or sorry, Moses is um, approached by God at a burning bush. He's 40 years in the wilderness. He wants, to, wants Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. We call that the Exodus. He appears to Moses. He says, I want you to go to my people. And um, you're to lead them out of Egypt, and I'm going to send you to Pharaoh, and I'm going to tell you to tell him you're to let my people go. And Moses says, hey, what do I say? Your, your people don't know who you are. Who do I say? And they're going to ask, well, who sent you to us? Who is this God that sent you to us? They had very little knowledge about God. God's going to later explain to them. That's why he gives them the Ten Commandments. He gives them all these laws. He's trying to show them, I'm not like any of these gods of Egypt. I'm holy. I'm set apart. I'm not like these weird gods that you serve. They're much, much like man. I'm totally different. That's a little bit of why you get all these things in the Old Testament. But he says to Moses in Exodus 3.14, and he said this to the people of Israel, and he said, he said to Moses, he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you, okay? That's what he says for Moses to tell the people. I am has sent me, not God. Tell them I am because I am that I am, okay? Now, he gets into the dispute, Jesus, in the New Testament with the Pharisees, accusing him of a demon, and he says, you dishonor me, but my father honors me, and they had this little debate. Um, and they say, we have no other father but Abraham, and he says this, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. So even Abraham knew there's going to be a person who's going to come, which will be my seed, and somehow will bless all the nations through me. He's coming one day. And so he only kind of saw kind of a far off shadow of this, right? But he rejoiced it. He saw it and was glad. And this is how they responded. You are not yet 50 years old, they said to him, and you have seen Abraham? Very truly I tell you, Jesus answered, before Abraham was born, I am. At this they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. Now notice what he says. He does not say, before Abraham was born, I was, like I pre-existed before Abraham. That's not going to tick him off. They're just going to think, you're, you're a madman. You're, you're, you're not that old. It's not like you were kind of there and then incarnate. You're just a, they treat him like he was a crazy man. They knew exactly what he was saying. He said, before Abraham was, I am. What was he doing? He says, I am God. I've been saying it all along. And, and what did they do with people who claimed to be God? That was blasphemy. What did they do? Picked up stones to stone them. Wait a minute. This guy just called himself the great I am. Okay? Jesus is God. They do this on another occasion. Pick up stones to stone him. He says, Jesus says to him, for which one of these miracles do you stone me? They say, none of, for none of these miracles, but for you being a mere man, make yourself out to be God. Okay? Jesus is God. We worship God in Jesus. Isn't that amazing? So when you're talking to Jesus, when you're discussing things with Jesus, you're talking to God. Okay? He's the God man. It's who we, you know, I used to have on my Facebook page when I was on Facebook, um, six, seven years ago, and then I gave up that sinful behavior. 
I'm kidding you. It's my own choice, right? Um, I used to put, you know, religion, I just put, for, you know, follower of a first century Galilean, you know? And then, if, you know, if I went on, I said, you know, claimed to be God, went around telling people he was God. So, yeah. This first century Galilean was God in the flesh. It's who I've decided to put my allegiance to. I absolutely believe God came down, incarnated himself as a man, provided a way to make peace with God. Jesus is God. Don't ever doubt it. It's all over the Bible, okay? Fantastic. And that's what he's saying. This guy's the image of the invisible God. I mean, okay? So first of all, he's God. <clears throat> Secondly, he's responsible for creation, Paul says, right? So he's God, then he goes on, he's going to say, listen, he's responsible for creation. Of course, because he's God. In the beginning, God what? Created the heavens and the earth. What does he say here? For in him all things were created. Why is that? Because he's God. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Why does he include that? What could possibly be invisible? Angels, things we can't see. See how he's already combating? The heck are you doing? Worshiping angels as if Jesus wasn't enough. Because someone has told you some of that Jesus is not sufficient, that there's a knowledge about angels and they're part of it. They are subservient to them. He created them. Why would they outrank Jesus? Okay? Everything you see, whether things you can see or things you can't see, Jesus made them. He's the creator. The second person of the Trinity created the world. You find this all through Hebrews too. Okay? So that, you know, you got Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The great creator was Jesus. Everything was made by Jesus and for Jesus. Okay? Visible and invisible were thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. These could be man-centered. Okay? He, cre- he set all that up. Or these could be, because oftentimes this refers to, again, angels, both good and bad. You'll find this in Ephesians. Again, what he's saying is he created all those things. He is not subserving it to them. You don't need the worship of angels. Jesus is sufficient. You're worshiping the God-man here. Of course, they didn't know what they didn't know. That's why much of the New Testament is to explain to a whole bunch of people who have put their faith in a simple message that went around and suddenly they believe because it's the power of God. Now he's trying to show them, this is what you've put your faith in. Okay? All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. Okay? So he's the sustainer of everything. That's Jesus. He sustains everything. He created everything. I was talking to Pastor Jason about this. If you boil it right down, you could just say in an everyday level, when you look at Jesus, because he's God, because he's the creator, remember this. We forget about this when we go to Jesus about things. Jesus is really, really smart. Anyone here have knee problems? No one? I don't believe that. Half of you are, okay. Does Jesus know what's wrong with your knee? Yeah, because he made it could talk to Jesus about your knee. He's really, really smart. He's not this kind of effeminate little picture of a guy who will run around and blessed are the poor in spirit. You know, we kind of think, it's like, Jesus was not in heaven with Einstein going, oh, fascinating, E equals MC square. I had no idea, you know. <laughs> Fear of relativity. It's just like, Jesus knew all that. He's the smartest man that ever walked the earth. He was God. He created the universe and he holds it together. Everything's sustained by him, and it's for him, and it's through him, okay? So on a practical basis, he's really smart. You can go to him about everything. Make Jesus the center of all your prayers. Jesus, I don't know. I can't figure this out. Jesus is not going to be there. Ooh, that's a good one. Ooh. <laughs> you know? I foresayeth unto you that, they, you know, we just kind of get this weird vibe about Jesus. He's really smart. He knows everything, Okay? Now, part of that, he created all things. We've got to almost look at, you know, for me, practically speaking, when it talks about he created all things, it's for him and through him. One sense, if you look at what the Bible teaches about creation, we call creation, Paul does this in Romans and other places, we call it common grace. There's a special grace that he gives to those who have put their faith in Jesus and he forgives their sins and never holds them against them and gives them a righteousness. That is special grace. You receive that by faith and belief. But there's a common grace The Bible says that he causes the sun and the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. 
There's a certain point where God just says, you know what, I've created the world and I want a common grace for all people and creation is one of them. I want people just to, I don't want everyone to be miserable and I've given creation. If you were at the midweek prayer service, you saw we put up there a video kind of showing creation, kind of a, kind of a looping thing because the heavens declare the glory of God. There's something about that that just makes us all go, oh, you know, for me it was just like, I need to get on vacation, you know, I need to. Even if it's just sand and water, that's enough of God's creation sometimes. I just need that for a week, right? But that's common. Now, what does that say about God there when we talk about he's the creator? God knows ultimately what makes you happiness. Run to Jesus for your happiness. He is the source of your happiness. He knows what will make you happy. Do you realize that? If you're unhappy, go to Jesus. He really cares about that. That's why he created what he did for everyone. He's the source of my happiness. He's not outside it. It's somehow caught up in Jesus, okay, as you think of him. So he's God, he's responsible for creation. He is also preeminent. Paul goes on, verse 15. <clears throat> the Son is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. This does not mean, because we've just talked that he's God, he is the great I am. He's not created, okay, he's the uncaused cause. Firstborn over all creation means he's preeminent. Okay? It has to be first in status, first in importance. Thus, that's why he plays off the creation account. Listen, everything was made by him, and it's all for him. He is preeminent over it all. Paul uses it again. I think of the 19 here or 18. He's the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. Now, again, this is, he's preeminent. He's the first among the dead. This also can also be first in time, meaning he's the first of the dead, to really taste resurrection life. Now you'll find in the New Testament, for example, he wrote, he um, raised Lazarus from the dead, but Lazarus just got his old body back. Jesus was the first to experience a resurrection body. He was the first for that, like Jesus is the first in everything. That's why at the end, when we get to Revelation, I'm the Alpha and I'm the Omega. I'm the beginning, I'm the end. If you get to the book of Revelations, everything is about Jesus. He writes to the churches, he's the lamp, um, later, he's the lamb that was slain that all the nations see and some mourn and wail because now they realize who he is. And that's why it says, listen, one day, whether they like it or not, every knee is going to bow and every tongue will confess and go, oh my gosh, he really was who he said he was. And they will confess that Jesus is Lord. And then he's the center of the temple. He's the center of the city. He's the light. Everything goes back to the lamb. Everything's about Jesus. That's why he was the lamb who was slain the Bible says, Christians believe this from the foundations of the world. So it was always the plan of the Trinity that everything would be about Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That he would die for the sins of the world, and at the book of Revelations, everything's about we're all worshiping the Lamb. It's just Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> okay? Which means he's preeminent. Paul's trying to tell him, listen, he's not one of many options for you. He's not one of many paths to happiness. He's not one of many paths to grow. Jesus is preeminent. He's supreme over every single thing. He's first. Okay? He's center. So he's God, responsible for creation. He's preeminent. That's why everything's made by him and for him because it's always, always about Jesus. And finally, Paul says, he's the head of the church. And he slips this in here and he's going to talk about it more. What's he say here in verse uh, 18? And he is the head of the body, the church. Okay? And uh, that's both a universal church, which means there's believers all over the world. Really that? Millions and millions of people meeting in churches all over the world. God knows who the true church is. He knows everyone who's really confesses Jesus Christ as Lord. And he's the head of that church. Okay? And we're the body. My says we're the Bible of Christ. So there's this intimate connection. He's telling them, listen, in your, now he can boil it down to those local Colossians, right? Because they're meeting as a gathering. What's a church? It's an ecclesia. In the Greek, they would have read, he's the head of the ecclesia. They said, oh, that's us. We're the gathering. We're the people who are gathered together. And he's saying, he is your head, right? He is your source. He is preeminent. You're intimately connected. You don't, why would you? Start giving yourself to all this strange teaching about angels and special days. It's all about Jesus. In fact, in your church, he's the head of the church. He's the center of your church. Okay? You're connected to him. He's the center of this church. Who's the head of this church? It's Jesus Christ. Okay? 
We're intimately connected to him. So that's who he is, okay? Now, what has he done? Because Paul will go on and not only explain to these people, hey, this is who Jesus is, but what has he done? And I'll just put this in a phrase. Um, Of course, Jesus has done many things to us. That's what we've talked about, grace. Remember what grace is? Grace is God giving us what we need, right? You need forgiveness. You need salvation. You need the Holy Spirit in your life, you need all kinds of unmerited blessings, you need special people bouncing into your life at times, you need teaching, you need knockings on the Holy Spirit of your head and your heart and all that stuff. God knows what you need, he always gives it to you, right? But the main thing that the Bible says is you and I first need, the first step for all of us, we have to be reconciled to God. We're not naturally reconciled to God, God has made a way for you to be at peace with him, okay, to make peace with God. What's he say, how does he do this? Verse 20, he goes on. This is what Christ has done for you. That's who he was. Listen to what he's done for you. And now through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. That's what Jesus has done for you. He is reconciled. What is reconciling? Well, it's making peace. So if you were reconciled, you know, some people get reconciled with their dad or their mom. It's like, man, I finally reconciled to my dad. What does that mean? Reconciliation just means those who were once hostile now are now at peace with one another. I got to go and reconcile with my sister. I got to go apologize. I got to make peace, okay? And that's what God is saying that Jesus has done. Through his shed blood on the cross, the hostility between you and God is gone. Hostility on your part. You ever notice when you come to Christ? Some of you are very, anyone here kind of anti Christian? Yeah, you were kind of really ticked off at God, right? In fact, we had a former pastor here. His testimony was. Someone would ask me, hey, what do you think about Jesus? And his answer was, I hated him. I just told him, oh, I hate him. He, he just felt like Jesus was to blame for, you know, if Jesus was so powerful. You know. But later when he came to be a Christian, put his, faith in, put his faith in Christ, he stopped hating Jesus. So it's not only reconciling my hate towards him, but it's, one, it's God's wrath, which is his righteous judgment towards me, has also now been satisfied in Jesus. Okay? That's what it means to be justified justification, you're either justified in your your behavior or not. Do you understand what that means? It means your behavior is already viewed in an okay way or it's viewed in a negative way, right? If I got mad at my kid, I'd say, well, that does not justify, you know, they're making excuses. I don't care. That doesn't justify what you just did to your sister. You knocked her down. That does not, I don't care if she said that does not justify you, which means in my eyes that it does not make it right. Or it could be, I said, Wow, that does justify you in knocking her down. She shouldn't have taken three of the cookies when there was only, you know, I'm making this being silly, right? Okay? It's always a view. So when God says you've been justified, it means God looks at you differently now. Why does he look at you? He doesn't look at you as a sinner. He looks at you as a child who's been forgiven. Why does he look at you differently? You've been justified through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, which means he counts your sins now as forgiven and Christ's righteousness put on you. That's what it means to be justified. Okay? So you've been made right with God. Romans 5, 8, and 10. Here's what Paul says. Let's just talk about this a bit. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, okay, which means viewed differently by God, not as sinners anymore, How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, that's a scary thought, right? But it means like we didn't meet the righteous requirements. God's a righteous God. He's a holy God. He's a good judge that doesn't just go, it doesn't matter what they do. I'm not going to get bent out of shape. He has judgment. That's the one side of God. Absolutely just. Absolutely perfect. Never makes mistake. Judges everyone right and fairly, but offers a way for you and I to find peace, for you and I to find payment, okay? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, that's the good news. The bad news is you're a sinner. You don't deserve to go to heaven, and I don't. But the good news is he's made a way for you to do that, okay? And that's why you've heard the old saying, good people don't go to heaven because there's no such thing as good. Someone tells me good and I start listening to their story, listening to their family members, I'm going, boy, they are, they're, they're on something if they think they're good. You know, I'm not saying there's some good things about you, but don't tell me that you're a good person, OK? 
okay? We won't get into the Ten Commandments, but we've all violated them, right? God's reconciled us now, right? Made peace through the death of his son. That's the good news. There is bad news, but the good news is, hey, it's all about good news for us. You have a chance to be reconciled, okay? If we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved now through his life? Again, which just means Jesus is now preeminent. He's the center. Wait till you see now that you're saved, what his life can do to your life. Save simply means rescue. You, you want to be rescued? Well, he'll rescue you initially, and then I guarantee you, he will rescue you continually. And that's why the Bible talks about rescuing us from our empty way of living. Anyone had an empty way of living before? Bill, you have an empty way of living? Okay. Wait till you see what he can do now that you've been saved. Now he's really going to save you. Okay. So that's what he's done for us. He's reconciled us to himself. And he talks about whether things on earth and things in heaven, we saw that part of the text. What basically he's saying is everything in God's universe finds its peace and solution ultimately in Jesus. We don't know how that all takes place. But somehow, the Bible says, even creation groans longing. Somehow Jesus just one day is going to roll everything up and everything will find its solution in Jesus. That's why he's the center at the very end. Okay? So Jesus reconciles all things to himself. Now let me just ask, because sometimes we think, is that conditional or unconditionally? So unconditionally, we find reconciliation with the Father. There's always the one condition, and the one condition that the Bible says is belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll find that through the book of Acts. These men laying down their lives, and women, by proclaiming again and again, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and what? You will be saved. Okay? Whether they were to Jews or pagan religious people, they pleaded, they begged, they went to their deaths because they said, no, you have to believe in order to, he wants to reconcile you, but you can't be reconciled to God unless you actually believe that Jesus is the way. And that's why Jesus says back in the book of Revelation to us at the very end, makes another plea with humanity. He says, listen, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I'll have fellowship with them and them with me. But you've got to open the door. So that's the one condition of reconciliation for all of us. And that kind of leads to our final point here. What does God want us to do? What does God want us to do? What must I do? Well, I must accept Jesus' offer of peace and reconciliation. Jesus has done a... That's what Jesus has done. What does he want you to do now? First thing he wants you to do, right? Accept his offer. Okay, 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says this, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. God's a great God. Skies are friendly. It's all there. Here's the sun. It's good news for everyone. You, you, don't, you don't need judgment. You don't have to worry about me. Just, here's the sun. Okay? God has given us eternal life, and this life is where? It's found in his son. Whoever has the son, John says, has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. That's the Christian Belief. If you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. And that's why, again, it's the plea. You've got to accept God's offer of peace and reconciliation. Okay? 1 John 1.12 says this, Yet to all who did receive him, I'm going to receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. How do you become a child of God? We're not all children of God. We're all God's creation, but we're not all his children. The Bible's very clear about that. How do you become God's children? You put your faith in his son, you get reconciled, you get your sins forgiven, and then God begins to save your life. Okay? But I have to open my heart, I have to open my mind, okay? I have to open my life to Jesus. I have to say yes to Jesus. I have to, can't say no anymore to Jesus. Okay? I have to say no to my sins, that means repentance, no to my self-righteousness. Does that make sense? The Bible says you have to repent both of your sins and your self-righteousness. Some of you don't feel like God could ever forgive you. You're too sinful. The Bible will say no. Some of you feel like you're not sinful at all. That's what the Bible calls self-righteousness. You will not save yourself. 
I will be very disappointed one day if I think I can save myself. I will stand before him and realize I'm not anything like this guy. Well, it's not a guy, but he's God of the universe. I'm not anything like him. I need the son to save me. Okay? Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You've got to be reconciled to God. Okay? Isn't that beautiful? Step number one. Step number two. If you've done that, you've got to make Christ the center now of all you do. That's Paul's whole thing. Listen, Jesus is supreme. He is the center, and you've got to make him the center, Colossians, in your life. Make Jesus the center of all you do. In fact, the cool thing is, what the Bible talks about is, God hasn't left us alone to try and make Jesus the center operating principle of our life, the supreme object of our worship and our affection and our thoughts, because he's made creation It's all for him. It's all through him. He is the lamb. We will worship him one day. We will see him like he really is. We'll be amazed. He's not left you alone in that. He's actually given you something called the Holy Spirit. John 16, Jesus tells his disciples this. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. Because we always need teaching, right? He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So we know, one thing we notice about the Trinity, they're all, it's amazing how they just submit to what Jesus says. I submit myself to the Father while here, only do what he tells me to do. Then he says, the Spirit's going to come. The Spirit's going to glorify me. And he will tell you what is to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. What's the whole role of the Spirit? He wants to glorify Jesus. He wants to lift Jesus up. He wants to make Jesus the center of your life. It's the reason for the Holy Spirit. If Jesus, if you have a big, huge, ah, Jesus, you're amazing, you're wonderful, I'm not, if you have a real emotional worship time with Jesus, you know who just showed up there in your life? That is evidence at that moment that the Spirit has kind of breathed on you a bit. When Jesus is glorified, you can tell the Holy Spirit. When we're all sitting here in worship and we're all really feeling it, and we're all, like the Holy Spirit showing up. And you ever notice when we're doing that, it's all about Jesus in that moment. Isn't that great? That's how you know when the Holy Spirit's showing up. Like, Jesus is glorified, the Spirit's got to be here. Okay? That's the role of the Spirit. Let me put it to you in this way. I'll give you a closing illustration on this. Um, back in the mid-80s, I was three. I hate the way you guys laugh so quickly. And I'm kind of playing with my age. I um, guess that Landcom is not working. Um, kind of newer on the scene, although it really came in the late 70s, was something called, well, it was contemporary Christian music. But we didn't call it contemporary Christian music then, like Big Daddy Weave and those bands. What did we call it, guys, girls? We called it Christian rock, right? It's like brand new. Christians were still kind of at that point wrestling uh, can we redeem, is there any, you know, that's the whole thing about trying to discern as Christians. Are there some things out of our culture that we can redeem and that are still good and enjoyable? Well, of course there is, right? And then there's other things that we realize with discernment and wisdom after a while, that's all junk and it doesn't help me. But, so there was this big thing about Christian rock, you know, is it good, is it bad, should we be listening to it? Parents, it was all, because it was so new, like my parents were like at first like, oh, just so against it, right? But I was loving it. I was like, oh, they're like speaking my language. It's about, you know, so. And so I would begin to kind of collect the music and trade tapes with friends. And I was probably pirating, but I didn't realize it back then, you know, punching little tabs up. But I had my boom box with my dual cassette player, right? And I'd be taping and then I'd, I'd make albums. And then, well, once in a while we get, so we begin to get these posters, which you had to kind of sell over the counter in a brown bag because no one wanted to, no, I'm kidding, it wasn't that bad, but it was close. And I'd pin these up in my room. My parents hate, so I'd pin them all up in my room. Now, one thing I noticed as I was reflecting on this, my kids don't pin up any posters in their room. It's just like that's all kind of a weird thing, right? Or do some of you still pin up posters in your room? But it was like it was the center of what I was into, right? Then I got into U2. It's like U2 was up there for a while. But I would take them down. This is the whole thing. Because my dad was so, 
The occasional time I knew my dad was going to come into my room, I'd be taking down certain posters like, oh, shoot, if he sees them, he'll think it's, he'll, he'll, he'll write off, like if he sees Striper up there, he'll think, oh, my goodness, you know, the son's going to hell, he's got Striper, who's this Striper band? They look like some ACDC rock band, and I'm really dating myself talking about Striper, right? <laughs> but they were, now why? I mean, it was the operating, I mean, that was my life. I mean, I loved it. Now, here's what Paul's trying to say, listen. The Holy Spirit has Jesus pinned up in his room. He's pinned up all over the place, and that's, Jesus, the Holy Spirit wants Jesus pinned up in your room, okay? And you gotta think Monday comes, tomorrow comes, how do you pin Jesus up? How do you make him the center of your life, the center of your affection, the center of your attention? That's what Paul's saying. He's preeminent. He's supreme. He's God. He's creator. He's worthy of worship. Make him the center. Make him the, pin him up. Find a way to pin him up, right? Part of that is you bring him into every part of your life. You don't, you don't have this sacred, secular dichotomy. You bring Jesus into everything, okay? That's part of it. So I bring him into my hobbies. I bring them into my business because I'm going to pin Jesus up there too and then I'm going to let him kind of show me, well, how do I, how do I make this so that you're center of this too? And I got to fi- figure out this really hard, smart Christian thinking, right? And then I think part of it too is, and someone said this once, until you get really passionate about Jesus, you really can't trust any of your passions because it's the nature of the human heart that everything kind of breaks down and we begin to forget what's preeminent. When he's not preeminent, we try to make other things, we pin other things up, right, that we think will satisfy so part of that, as Lewis says, it, begins, it starts at the beginning of the day where you let a, a kind of a softer, quieter, gentler, but bigger voice flood into your life. And then it gets easier. Then the whole day, it's one sense there's a greater invasion into your life. It's easier to pin Jesus up the whole day and everything when you've gotten up in the morning, you've opened his word, and you said, you're, you know, you're preeminent in this word. You'll be preeminent one day. I'm going to make you preeminent. First thing, I'm going to pin you up now in hopes that as I go through my day, you're pinned up all over the place. But I'm going to make you center. And guys, if we're going to have a year of renewal and revival and breakthrough, Jesus has to become the operating principle of your life. He has to become everything to you. Like today, Monday, this is all about Jesus. How do I make Monday about Jesus? That's not easy at first, but it's from there that we go on to greater things. Make it about Jesus. Set the rules, set the hurt, just like, okay, Jesus, can I set that aside and just go to you? who loved me and gave himself for me, okay? And we're gonna stand and we're gonna actually sing this together as a prayer. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna stand. I want you to stand. In fact, you stand now and I'll pray. And let's make this prayer kind of be our closing thought together. Let me pray and then we'll sing. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for this, thank you for this Godman coming to earth. God of gods, light of light, very God of very God, the great I am who loved us reconciled us to God by shed blood on the cross. Thank you for the offer of peace and reconciliation. I pray that someone would open up their heart to Jesus right now, their life to Jesus right now, that they would turn from self-satisfaction, smugness, contemptness, and let Jesus in. And all of us, Lord, it's so hard to pin you up in certain areas. So we want to, first of all, always repent and say, we're sorry for pinning up all all kinds of other things that become the dominating factor and help us to get Jesus to be the center of it all. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.